Good evening, afternoon, everybody. It's Paul Woodadge again. It's World War Two today, and it's our first show of the week. And I'm really excited about this one because it's a story I've wanted to cover since I first had these ideas for live streams back 11, 9, 10 months ago now. So joining me live from the USA is Carol Schultz-Vento, the daughter of Arthur Dutch Schultz of C Company 505th and the author of a really incredible book um, I'm going to share on you the, the screen now um, about Carol learning about her father understanding what her father went through understanding the the effect the war had on him but that's that's for a bit later in the show um good evening carol how are you good evening paul i'm fine how are you i'm good i'm, I'm glad i'm always glad once we've started the show i always get a bit nervous before once they start it's good so um a lot to unpack here um because a lot of people watching this they're their first understanding of what your father did will have been the longest day film because he was famously played by Richard Bamer, who was arguably at the time longest day came out the most famous actor because of coming off the back of West Side Story. Perhaps okay. less so now we look at Richard Burton, Henry Fonda and John Wayne. But in 62, um, Richard Bamer uh, was was king of the world and he ended up playing your father. So um, we will touch on the movie later on, but let's start with where your father was born um how he his childhood was and how he ended up joining the american airborne okay uh dad was born in uh, phoenix arizona uh in 1923 to his mother was uh an army she had been an army nurse in world war one his dad had been a world war one marine uh he was born there then they moved pretty quickly to uh colorado uh, because both of my grandparents at that point uh, had tuberculosis, which was, I guess, maybe the after effect of World War One, And that's why they were in Arizona. Then they moved to Detroit uh, for work. And he was about three or four. So all of his upbringing was in Detroit when it was really like a bustling motor town city. And from um, his description of his growing up in Detroit, it sounds like it was like an idyllic, wonderful time for him. He was um, he was a star athlete in um, in baseball and basketball. He was sort of like, you know, king of the high school. He had a, a baseball scholarship to Western Michigan. Uh, he graduated, I guess, June of forty one. During that summer, he joined the Civilian Conservation Corps, and he was down in uh, New Mexico near his, where his paternal grandmother was. And then um, before, like, you know, he had a went off to, to college, uh, World War II broke out. And he wanted to sign up immediately. His younger brother signed up for the Marines. Uh, my grandmother was very sort of protective of my father. She didn't want him to go in the Marines. So uh, she went down to the uh, recruiting office and said she wanted to make sure he got into some kind of safe area in, in the army. And uh, he was anti-aircraft in Norfolk, Virginia to begin with. Um, then I guess he saw Sorry. <laughs> no worries. All that advertisement for. Um, You're. F turn yeah. that off. There we go. Okay. Uh, you saw an advertisement for Airborne, and uh, he decided that he was going to. Uh, to volunteer and he uh, he volunteered he went to Fort Benning for training and part of it was that his his younger brother was all <clears throat> already from what my dad told me he was already in Guadalcanal <laughs> as a marine and you know so there goes the dream of my my grandmother that my dad was in a safe place in Norfolk Virginia um, he volunteered for for the airborne he uh, trained to Fort Benning and then he went over I guess in late 43 uh, he told me he I guess 
they landed first in Belfast, Northern Ireland, yeah, and, and then eventually uh, went to to Quorn. Am I saying that correctly? Yep, yeah, yeah, not near Nottingham. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, or Lincolnshire. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And then he said part of a part of the issue was that he was like a boxing champion, so he said he spent more time practicing for the uh, boxing matches than he actually did for you know for combat which is is sort of what what led to at first he was he was told by uh his company commander at that time i think it was uh, anthony stefanich that maybe he wouldn't they wouldn't be able to fit him in a plane <laughs> and he was sort of like heartbroken but they did fit him in a plane and I think he said he went in with uh, uh, Mortarman. And that's what got him to Normandy. Normandy was his first jump. Yeah. So, um, again, people watching this, they're going to know. I mean, some will have read the book. Some will understand the wider history. But for a lot of people, the frame of reference is going to be the movie. And the movie, of course, moves things around, ends up with characters in different places. And, and, and your father's story is is used i suppose as a as a an a example of how people ended up getting a bit confused in the drop zones and not knowing where they were and so he's this where other things are happening with with purpose and they know where they are and they're going off to do things your father is always shown to be quite not quite aware where he is ends up of course famously with richard burton uh and the german with the boots on and all that was converging about five stories into one and the pilot who richard burton is playing was nowhere near the american airborne sector and all that kind of stuff but let's run through actually what your father's um t-day or normandy campaign was i mean c company 505 they're jumping into the uh, drop zone oh near santa Maria glees and the job of 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 the battalion is lafayette bridge and seizing the road west out of san Maria so what did your father do in, uh, with, with in reality compared to the movie version um well after he jumped he was all alone in a field and he heard a noise and he went to uh, get his gun and he realized he didn't have any ammunition in it. And it was, it was a cow, the noise, thankfully, that he heard. Uh, he wandered around for a while and he was found by uh, Lieutenant Jack Tallarday, who also found maybe three or four others. And so Jack Tallarday said to them, okay, wait here. I'm going to go down the road and find out what's going on. And they, they waited for about an hour and he didn't come back. So they started down the road and he saw Jack Tallarday on the side of the road. He thought he was dead because he wasn't moving at all. And uh, they just kept walking until they came up to a group that uh, General Gavin had assembled of about a hundred lost paratroopers. Uh, it turned out Jack Tallarday wasn't dead. He had been shot and he had been um, given so much morphine by the various medics that he was basically unconscious at that point. Um, my dad said that the night of D-Day, that evening, uh, of General Gavin, Gavin had them along the railroad tracks, and I don't know the geography there, but he, he said it was like near an apple orchard and railroad tracks, and he had had them dig foxholes there. And my dad said that um, they, they were shelling all night. Um, he said he never had been so afraid in his life, and that he could hear screaming from an, another foxhole of someone who had been hit. Um, so I I never thought that he had seen been in the middle of any of that, you know, from from the movie. But uh, and then he then he told me that he was involved, you know, and he said it took like three days in terms of the fighting at, at the bridge. Right. Two or three days. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I mean, the, just for people who are watching and who, who have been to Normandy, who have been to Normandy, the railway line bisects the road that runs from San Marigli's west. Um, and the area from the, the railway line down to the river Murderay, where the bridge is about a mile, I suppose, 
And so James Gavin came down near the railway line. So it's putting your father landing actually pretty much squarely on drop zone O where he was supposed to. The idea of the movie being lost is actually not the case. He may not have been with anybody he knew immediately, but he wasn't in the wrong place. He just that it was a, uh, as you know, as with Normandy, there's fields 50 yards across. And if you're in one field, you feel like you're on your own, but there's a person on the other side of a hedge in another field. Oh. Right. So right. Um, that area there, defending the banks of the Murderbray River, if he was with Gavin, he was in that battle there. And you're quite correct. The battle for Lafayette Bridge took th three days um, uh, uh, to, to to hold it and then move west and towards Courtenay. So, I mean, we'll touch more later in the show about what your father went through after war, but it seems already that he begins to kind of play things down a little bit and and sort of say, oh, well, it was my he doesn't didn't as many of them they didn't dwell on the, oh my god it was hectic action all the time we were being shot at all the time it's lots of sort of you know well we were just there we were doing this and. Right. That's the nature of the beast, really. But um, we but to backpedal a little bit, um, we, we must mention the whole money, gambling, crapshoot thing that the mm -hmm. Longest Day movie covers. And um, and Jerry Columbi, who I met a couple of times, who was one of your father's friends, he was involved in that whole story as well. In the movie, of course, John Steele, Red Buttons, is in that little group as well. And he was in a different uh a company and that they again they move people around to have them in the same scene but do, do you know what the real story is behind the the the, the crap shoot and the money well he told me like you know later in life that uh yeah my grandmother did send uh rosaries and i i still have them be because my grandmother was always i think i don't know if she was always sending rosaries but she was quite religious and he really believed, you know, in the rosary. And that was like, sort of like good luck for him. Uh, and he won that money, but he said it wasn't only getting the rosary, but he couldn't stand the Sergeant who was winning uh, at that point in that craft game. So we, he went back to try to get, try to beat the Sergeant and get more money. And he did lose it all. Mm. I mean, yeah. again, with those watching, I mean, that just with the, it's clear we we now understand the movie is using various stories. I mean, the the fact that in the movie um, that the, the column of Americans goes past the column of Germans going the same way that apparently is a real story. That happened to Jack Spiegel's group in the five oh eight. So Cornelius Ryan got these various stories, and then in for the film, they 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 gave them all to your dad, I guess, right. because it was right. convenient a cat, hat, coat hanger for all these different escapades and stories. But, right. um, you know, he went for the Normandy campaign. The, the purpose of this show actually isn't to go through the Normandy campaign of 82nd Airborne. We're going to do that in other shows. We're here to talk about your father and, and your relationship with your father. But um, he, run, run through the, the, the rest of your father's war service uh, in terms of the, 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 the high moments. I mean, he was the 505th were there at the sharp end all the way through. So, so Normandy was just the first run, run through what happened next. All right. Well, I, he was like 10 days in Normandy. He had hurt his back uh, quite severely uh, because it was a really, really low jump. And uh, after about 10 days, he couldn't walk anymore. So they evacuated him for about a week and then they sent him back to France. Uh, he didn't talk much about that, you know, the fighting after that. Uh, the next thing he talked to me about, and I did get uh, uh, Stephen Ambrose's archives and Cornelius Ryan archives to see what he had told them in the interviews. Uh, but the next thing was Market Garden, yes. and he told me that that was a uh, that was an easy jump, you know, considering comparatively. He, he said jumping into a like a field with hay was like jumping onto a mattress. Um, the main thing that he talked about with Market Garden was the death of his company commander, um, uh, Anthony. Stefanich, if I'm saying that correctly. I think so, yeah. Um, and he said that that's the only time he sobbed in combat because uh, Anthony went to help a glider get, get uh, some of the glider men who were stuck under German fire and he got killed. And my dad I guess ran over there and he said that's the only time he cried in combat. He said he sobbed because he, uh, he said he was like an older brother to him. Mm. He didn't talk much about 
Market Garden. I mean, he just really, I, I had to pry this information out of him in his older years. And I think he was pleased that I started to ask all these questions about the war because I started to realize, well, other people had written about him and I never really asked him very many in-depth things. Uh, but he didn't really talk too much about, about, uh, about Market Garden. Uh, the next thing he started talking about was the bulge. And he, uh, he talked about how when, you know, uh, the Germans broke through that 82nd Airborne, obviously, and 101 were like called in immediately. They didn't even have any winter clothing. He said he had on long johns, a English, an English sweater, I guess a sweater that he had he had gotten while he was in Britain. And I guess he, so, yeah, yeah. He used a sleeping bag as a coat. Uh, he cut it and put it over his head and, you know, mm. used it to sleep in and as a coat during the day. And he said they didn't even have their winter boots at that point. So they, um, you know, I'm trying to remember where they, do they go to Grosbeek? I'm, I'm not sure. Grosbeek is Holland. Is that's, that's my yeah. garden. Uh, okay. um, you know, be um, Hoofalese area. Yeah. Well, we're, 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 yeah, we're, 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 in this case, we're not really into the, the, the dynamics okay. of how the battle going is, 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 right. is more for right. other shows. This is about your father's experiences. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, he went with the bulge. He ended up uh, with, uh, double pneumonia, I guess, right around Christmas. So he was uh, taken to a hospital for about a week. And then he, when he came back, he said that most of his uh, of C company was gone. A lot of the leaders were dead mm. or wounded. And he said it wasn't, uh, I, I know he wrote that if he could have cried, he could have gotten some of, of the, uh, the grief out at that point because it wasn't the C company with the leaders that sort of made him who he was, you know? Uh, so I know that, that really, that really, oh, you know, the, I, I don't even know how to describe the grief that he had going back there. Then next thing he started talking about was the Hurtgen forest. He started talking to me about that and how, when um, they were walking through and all the dead uh, were dead Americans who were in the Hurtgen Forest. And I guess it was maybe late February, March, but the snow was starting to melt. And he said, you could see like arms sticking up in part of a torso. And he said the, the, the smell was overpowering. And he uh, once again got pneumonia and he collapsed on the ground. And he, he said at that point, he didn't care whether he lived or died. Uh, and he said a lieutenant dragged him for a mile to an aid station. And he said it was sort of funny because he had the lieutenant's cap on and they were saluting him and he, you know, he didn't know why. But um, he was hospitalized again for about a week and then rejoined. Uh, so he, he never really talked to me sequentially. I think he just talked about the the parts that really, really uh, struck him so much emotionally um, as he started to answer my questions when uh, when he was older. Um, but I say that, that we'll come on this later on. This is this is a, when you have these conversations. This is this is decades later, isn't it? We've, we've got to get through this yeah, process of him nothing. closing off first, and then and we'll we'll get to that later on. Right. But you know, and and as many veterans I've spoken to, you don't necessarily get a coherent interview where they tell you through bit by bit on a time scale. It's a little bit here, a little bit there, kind of a scatter gun here, and you have to kind of build up your knowledge from a little bit of that story, a little bit of that story, and it can't, yeah. So you know, we, we, it's it's understandable that it his memories of that were, were, were difficult, but the, the, he did survive the war. And yet, but the key factor is he'd seen people go and uh, who he'd got very close to along the way. And this is going to be a theme we're going to touch later on right. with right. the thing about veterans. And I've met lots of veterans is that, that they went through at a very a young age, seeing people they were depending on in combat die. And it begins to close off their emotions. I think that's a fair way of it. And, and we will touch on that later on. And they begin to begin this process of just not letting it in, not let emotion in because you've seen people you care about die and 
you know, I've been with veterans, people like Earl McClung of Easy Company, who said that, you know, men you lose in combat, it's you have a love for men in combat that you would never have for your wife, your family, your friends. It's this this bond you go through because people are trying to kill you and you are trying to stay alive together. And so in the little bits you're saying, we're understanding that he's going through these emotional markers in his life that are that are then triggering things that get buried then come out later on but you know he did the point is he did survive the war and and then ironically just uh, well well i'll let you tell the story after he uh, he he he's discharged but he goes back into the army again so let, let's take us through the stage of of ve day demobilization but then back into the military again okay he came back um to america he his his parents were in California by that point. He came back to uh, Philadelphia where he had come on leave with one of his friends, one of his Italian American friends named Spags who lived in Philadelphia. And he came up from, oh golly, I guess I'm from Virginia. Uh, and he met my mom. And I guess every chance he had, he came up to spend time with my mom, but they really, really didn't know each other very well. But they, uh, he, he told her, you know, when I come after the war, I'm going to marry you. And that's what he did. I mean, they, they communicated all during the war. He came back uh, early December uh, from Europe and he married my mother on December 22nd, 1945. Um, then I, I was born at uh, the end of 46, and he ended up rejoining the Army. I think it was 47, 48, but he rejoined as in um, Army Counterintelligence Corps, and he had to go over to, um, to Europe. Well, he went to Fort Holabird first for training in Maryland. Then he was over in Germany, from what I, from what I was told, uh, you know, being sort of immersed in uh, German language training and whatever they were teaching in counterintelligence, because he, <laughs> he would he was very close mouthed about about the, the counterintelligence part. So um, he spent two years in Austria. We spent uh, a year with him in Zellensee. I went to. Uh, I was in first grade in Salem Zay at the uh, American Independence School. So I, I have a lot of memories of, you know, living in, in Austria in this enormous house with my dad being the agent in charge uh, at, at Salem Zay and his office was on the, on the first floor and we were on the second and third floors. Um, and, you know, I was six. So I mean, what did I really know about his job? <laughs> Just, mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I know he, he, he loved it. Uh, he, uh, eventually, I guess we, we left Zalemzai sooner than he did. Uh, probably maybe six months sooner. He came back to, uh, to America, to Philadelphia, and he was, um, an agent, uh, counterintelligence agent out of the Frankfurt Arsenal in Philadelphia. And, one thing that I didn't know until very late in life was that he was he was tasked with uh, following uh, Roy Cohn when the Army McCarthy uh, hearings were going on, mm. and he barely said anything about that. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, very sort of closed mouthed about that. He he ended up staying in um, in the Army until about well, till I was about eleven, uh, because then he they were going to send him for Russian training and my mother said she didn't want to do it and she wouldn't she was a daughter of Italian immigrants she didn't really want to go any more to any place else and she wanted to stay in Philadelphia so uh he left the he left the army at that point to I guess try to save the marriage and we moved to California for about six months um, for supposedly they were getting a fresh start there, but it didn't work. Uh, basically, my mom went back to sell the house in Philadelphia and came back and said, I'm getting a divorce and took us back. My dad stayed in California with his grandparents, with his parents, because we were living with them at that point. And he became a 
police officer in Coronado. Uh, then he eventually came back to Philadelphia, became a private, had his private detective firm in Center City, Philadelphia. Uh, he was hired as a investigator for a grand jury that was investigating corruption in Philadelphia, but that didn't last very long. Some, somehow the grand jury was disbanded after, after six months of something having to do with politics that I don't remember. Um, and how, how far do you want me to go with his? Well, with, um, I think well, I'll, I'll jump in now for a second, because mm -hmm. I think what's, well, the paradox with your father, interestingly, is um, the fact that um, he he's he he's involved in uh, talking about the war. I mean, he did the uh, he did the um, interviews with Cornelius Ryan and what have you, mm -hmm. and yet he's also beginning this this thing about concealing things and there's the marriage is falling apart so there's a so the slight paradoxical part about mm -hmm. about your father there that i don't quite understand when i you know read your book in that the ones who contributed to the books like the longest day tended to be the veterans who aren't dealing with any particular problems they're the ones who who are looking back positively at the war they don't mind talking about it they're the ones often going to reunions they're writing their memoirs and and yet your father isn't doesn't seem to fulfill that right type and yet he is talking about it so it seems there's like two two arthur schultz is establishing at this point there's the the one who kind of embraces the past by going and talking about it and the one who who's concealing it and 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 this i guess is when we're bringing up to the whole journey you have with your father and what's going on with it and the, the marriage breakup um mm -hmm. do you know do you know was he actively sought by cornelius ryan or did he kind of seek out cornelius ryan do you know which was the version yeah, it was I, 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 he told me what happened like you know once again later on he it was i guess during the time uh my parents marriage was broken up breaking up or getting really rocky but it was still uh, he was still at, at the arsenal, at the Frankfurt Arsenal. He was still CIC. And he said he saw a notice on the bulletin board there of uh, this author was looking for anybody who had been involved in D-Day just to write them. And then he would decide whether or not he wanted to interview them or not. And uh, so my dad wrote Cornelius Ryan. He told me the night that he, he said he was at work late and he had had a few drinks and he decided to write him. And then Cornelius Ryan got in touch with him and I guess wanted to follow up more in terms of um, terms of what my dad's experience was. And my dad said, Cornelius Ryan said that my dad didn't, uh, my dad in the letter must have talked about his fear a lot. <laughs> and that was one of the reasons why Cornelius Ryan wanted to, wanted to interview him. Um, and I do remember, I still have, uh, the copy of the book when it came out that he he in, inscribed for myself and my sister. It's a little dog-eared because one of my dogs got a hold of a <laughs> <laughs> like right your first edition, <laughs> right? Uh, but I still have that. So I mean, I remember when the book. I was old enough to remember when the book came out and I read the book. I was you know like twelve or uh, thirteen. I think it came out yeah you know, around twelve. I think it came out in fifty nine or so. Uh, so I, I do remember that. And by the time the movie came out, uh, my parents were already divorced. But I guess Cornelius Ryan just responded to, to, to dad's letter. That's that's the story mm. that I got. And, you know, and, and then, we, of course, we touched on it on him. It ends becomes a big part of the movie. But, um, right. you know, I went, for those watching, before we went live, Karen and I were talking about how we're going to kind of frame up this show. And, and that's kind of now part one concluded now. Part one is... Is, is is Arthur Arthur Schultz's career with the merch, but now is part two. Now now is the the journey you went on understanding your father because your father basically we would label him now as a PTSD sufferer mm -hmm. or something like that because World War Two obviously deeply deeply affected him and he didn't necessarily um, process some of it very well so talk about how you grow it's it's the carol part of the show now so okay. you're growing up with a father who you you know you just said that you're where you know he's he's been in the military he was still in the military after war he, he's a but then the police you know he's an authority figure he's a mm -hmm. hero he's he's all these other labels you would call someone who's airborne and yet as a father 
as a as a husband to your mother what was going on to your father in the in the 1950s and 60s well he my memories of my father are very positive when my parents were together i was extremely close to him he was a very in, involved father you know reading books giving us baths like taking us places he was quite involved because my mom was a uh uh hairdresser, beautician, and uh, a lot of, you know, he would come home from work and she would work in the evenings at a, at a shop uh, on the avenue uh, near where we lived. So he took, he took a lot of fathering responsibilities in those days. I, being a child, I didn't see, um, I think my mother and father had their disagreements and arguments in private because I don't remember growing up feeling like there was a lot of tension and everything in the home. The one thing that they did do when they were together was they parented well together. So um, I, I was extremely close to him as a child. I was, I sort of like almost parroted him, you know, uh, I, I'd, I'd come in crying if a boy down the street was picking on me and he'd be like, no, I'm going to teach you how to box. You go back out there and you defend yourself. You know, th those kind of things. Like uh, he taught me to be to be tough in a certain sense. I mean, I, I don't consider myself a tough person, but I guess I sort of am in some ways where I'll stand up for myself. And he he was very strong on, on teaching me that. And, and I was also a very sickly kid with rheumatic fever. And he was the one who took me to the doctors all the time. And, you know, in, with all of, like the shots and the, the taking blood and everything. And he's like, you know, you're strong, you'll be okay. And um, so he was, he was a positive influence in those years. My sister probably didn't get as much of it because she was four and a half years younger. So she didn't get as much of that and that like hands-on fathering that I did. Uh, when things started to, to, to fall apart was when, uh, when my mother divorced him. And, and then uh, my, my dad's alcohol use, I mean, he, as I, as I said to you before the show, he'd go across the street to the bar and get two quarts of beer in a brown paper bag. And during the night, just sort of like sip those two quarts of beer. So, I mean, I didn't think, honestly, I didn't think anything of it because he wasn't like overtly drunk or anything he he wasn't he was a disciplinarian in terms of like his words I mean you he was like you would listen to him but the punishment that he would he would give us is like you go stand in the corner and a few times I remember him like a threatening a spanking he he said what he would do is take his belt off and sort of snap his belt a few times. And he said, I was sobbing so much that he never actually gave me a spanking. So, mm. so he wasn't like, you know, I didn't grow up in that kind of harsh environment. Uh, uh, it, my memories of back then are that it was pretty positive. So when the, the divorce took place, it was sort of a surprise. And I can't say that, it was explained too well, but I know that my, my father really didn't want it. Uh, and that's when he started like drinking really heavily. Um, one of his fellow paratroopers that worked at the arsenal said that uh, he, I guess when all this was going on before they went to California, uh, I don't have exactly the timelines 100% correct, but he said that my dad didn't show up to work and he was living in some a small apartment near the Frankfurt Arsenal and they went over to see him and then he was sort of like unconscious with the, the gas stove turned on without the without the pilot light lit. And so the, the other agents that were friends said like, Joe, you need to bring him to live with your family, which, uh, which Joe did. Joe Talent was in the 82nd Airborne 5052 and they were, they were close, close friends. And he lived with, with Joe and Joe's. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're a popular person today. Yeah. Uh, he, lived, he lived with them for about um, three or four years. And he was, I didn't know at the time. I mean, he, we'd see him just about every weekend. If we didn't see him, my mother would say, uh, uh, your dad's sick. You should you should send him a card. And I remember going out to California in later years, and he had all these cards saved from myself and my sister. 
And I'm like, Dad, I didn't realize you were so sick during during all those years. We were always sending you cards. He said, yeah, I was usually in alcohol rehab. So I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> um, so it was sort of still hidden, I guess, about how how traumatic the war was. During this whole time, he had been uh, appealing to the VA for uh, for some kind of treatment. I, I got his VA records when I was after he died when I was writing the book and it shows that, you know, he was diagnosed, oh, diagnosed with, I gotta turn this off. I'm afraid I'll lose you though. <laughs> uh, with war neurosis. And he had been trying to get help, help for that for, for years. And they basically said inability to digest wartime experiences, mm. uh, you know, he, he was pretty much ignored. It, it was. I like, mean, this this is when I mean, there's people going to be watching this who whose fathers or grandfathers or great uncles are involved in the war. They will be recognizing things here because and, and I don't want to appear to be any way critical of the veterans associations and the, and the hospitals and the VA. But the thing is, if you had a leg taken off in the war, there was a set of procedures to enable you to be given a, a prosthetic leg and there were therapies and there was physiotherapy and you could be go through a process. The mental problem as men came back with, there just wasn't the infrastructure there to deal with it. And so although we can see now that there's a, we, we can be critical of the, of the, of the care he's getting, there just wasn't this care process in, in, in place then. And, and they didn't know what to do with these people. And what we know now is many, many more men and women were suffering this way, but they all thought they were the only one suffering it. They all didn't know what the, the solution was. And now, of course, we have this label for it. We can label it. And PTSD isn't just one thing. There's all branches of it and different various, but, the thing is we do have this label so the 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 when you know you, you, we mentioned your book because your book is about the process you go through to understand your father because you went through a a journey it's a cliche but you did of you know, loving and doting on your father as a young girl then understanding things weren't quite normal and then the difficult years and then finally this sort of understanding you had later on so you know either talk about the process of writing the book or the pro or as you were living it when, when did you realize what you know you already said you know you found out later that your father was in rehab and what have you what what effect was this having on happening having on you you the young carol at this point um well i think i, I think the scariest part is when he he called when i was about 16 and he he was uh he had been he got remarried by that point to his second wife and he called and I, I think he wanted to talk to my mother and my, my mother was out. And he said that he and his second wife had been drinking and they got into a big fight and she had slit her wrist and she was in the bathtub bleeding. And then he, he said, he, he said, uh, he's, he's, he's crying on the phone to me saying, I've been a failure. I was a, I was a horrible father. I'm a failure. I'm a failure. Uh, I don't know if I want to go on. And uh, later on, I found out that he had had a loaded gun next to him. Uh, I didn't know it at, at that time <laughs> exactly. But I'm like, no, dad, no, dad, you're not, you know, and I just like tr really tried to talk him down. And then I realized like, oh, my goodness, <laughs> like something is really seriously wrong my father's really seriously struggling uh more than struggling uh my mom came in like right after that phone call she called down there he he answered um and she was like she tried to talk him down then she called his friend joe tallett who um went down and got him and they had taken his wife to the hospital and she eventually was sent to the Norristown State Hospital, the mental institution for a while. And Joe put my father on a plane out to California uh, to my grandparents. And that was the last time my dad ever drank. But meanwhile, at that point, he was like trying to re his wife eventually got out of the mental hospital and rejoined him. And he was trying to rebuild his life then. Um, so barely heard from him. Uh, you know, we'd get letters and I guess mm -hmm. I was, I was 
pretty much hurt at that point because I was like, sort of felt like abandoned by him. Um, so we got letters and I'd write short letters back. And, you know, um, I came from an Italian immigrant. My mom's Italian immigrant family was all, all around, you know, we were very involved in my life. And, you know, my dad had always talked about me going to college and he, he was like, you know, going to help me figure it out because none of them had even graduated from high school. But I figured it out, you know, I, with my guidance counselor. And I went to, uh, to Temple University, which was in Philadelphia, so I could commute. I was a commuter student. And I figured it out myself and I, and I, and I got to college. But I was uh, walking down, the, you know, not having a lot of communication with my father. I'm walking down the street at Temple one day. And this man comes walking past me with another man. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, that's my father. Like, what do I do, right? <laughs> it's like, so I just sort of stood there and he walked right past me, not recognizing me. And uh, my boyfriend at the time, who I eventually married, I, uh, I went to meet him and he said, oh, let's go find him. So we're walking all over campus, which was a large campus, trying to find him. And, uh, and we didn't, um, I went home and told my mother, she called Joe Tal and said, yeah, he's, he's back in town. Uh, and that hurt that he was back in town and didn't contact us. So he called me that night and, um, uh, met, met with him and he said, well, I didn't really think you cared. And I'm like, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, uh, so I, I mean, that was that point we were trying to rebuild. He, he was trying to get his life on track. He got a job at a place called Ecoville Hospital because he had gotten a degree in uh, uh, psychology. He had gotten his college degree and he was at Temple in graduate school getting a master's in psychology. So he became uh, the director of the men's program at this Ecoville uh, Rehabilitation Center, you know, for, for alcoholics and drug addicts. And um, he was sort of like the role model of, you know, the tough guy running in counter groups at that point with, with, with alcoholics and addicts. Um, he had me come up there a few times and just, just watch him, uh, you know, through the, uh, like the one way. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's master Sergeant Schultz. Cause he eventually became a master Sergeant mm. uh, w with his counterintelligence service. That's master C Sergeant Schultz combined with his psychology background. <laughs> so um, we, we, uh, you know, when he was back in town, that then we started to stay in touch. He he ran. He was a director of a of a, a youth program in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which was called the, the Today Program, which was a residential uh, rehab for uh, addicted uh, youth. And he was he was a director of that for maybe about six or seven years. And I know the. Uh, chairman of the board who hired him said he was a cross between Attila the Hun and Jesus Christ in terms of the well, way, yeah. <laughs> way he dealt with people. And it must have been the paratrooper mentality. Then he, uh, he had a second wife divorced. Uh, he went back out to California. I remember he told us he was going out to California again because they were divorcing. So um, he drove out to California in an RV um, and I guess lived in the RV for a while. He, he drove out to near San Diego, which is where my grandparents had lived. They had both died by that point, but my aunt was still there. So he was living in a uh, RV trailer type of combination uh, then. And uh, that was in 1973. And at, at that point, uh, you know, my sister and I had seen him off. He gave us different pieces of furniture and I had his address, but I didn't really have his phone number because he only been out there for like a couple months. And then that's when my sister was killed in an accident. So I had to like, uh, in the middle, it was on Thanksgiving. So I, you know, my aunt and uncle came down and my uncle was able to get the phone number. And I had to call him in the middle of the night to tell him my, uh, my sister had been killed. So that was a, a memory that haunts me the way he mm. was. He was, you know, wailing. Um, he came back for the funeral, but then he went back to California, stayed in California and got married for the third time and got various jobs as directors of rehab programs. His final job before he retired was at Fort Irwin, 
where he was director of uh, drug and alcohol services uh, for returning for soldiers, which sort of was like full circle in, yeah. in a sense. Uh, and then he retired when he was about 65. Um, during that time, we basically, after my sister died, you know, he'd have me like fly out there every year. So I'd spend like three weeks with him. Uh, for the first few years, he was able to, to come back, but then he got a congestive heart failure and emphysema and he couldn't fly anymore. So I fly out there and once I had my daughter, uh, from the time she was three years old, we'd fly out there and we'd spend like a month in, of the summer with him every year out in, um, in the desert, near the Mojave Desert, where he ended up settling because it was near Fort Irwin where his last job was. And um, that's when we tried to like rebuild a relationship, which, you know, got sort of rocky again, I guess, because of the dynamics that were going on between my dad and his third wife. And I was trying to navigate that. So in some ways, the relationship with my dad really grew, but then there were some patches along the way. Mm. Um, but, you know, all in all, I have to say that we sort of just really reconnected in those years. And I felt really comfortable asking him all these questions. And I think he, he felt really pleased that I was finally getting it, you know, that, and I know the letters he wrote me when I was a teenager and these things were happening. He, he's like, I don't, I don't mean to be this way. I really love you girls. I'm, I'm this, you know, I'm this close to like falling up, totally falling apart. So he was always like cognizant, like he didn't want to be the way he was being and yeah. the impact on us. So. Well, you know, I, you know, we, it, it, interestingly, this is the first time you and I've ever spoken, apart from our test chat. We've known each other on Facebook for, well, I don't know, 15 years or something, but never actually communicated. But I remember you, know, um, you talking about how, in your terms of understanding it, you, you came to things with things like Sevian Pratt, Ryan, Banda, Brothers, where a, a modern way of expressing what men had went, went through in that war is that helped you understand a little bit about what your father had been through and brought brought your understanding of it better because as we know that the old the longest day movie i suppose represents that old type of movie where it's all everyone goes to war everyone's fine doing it and they come home and they have they they marry the sweetheart and they have the 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 donna reed lifestyle with the white picket fence and and now with modern films we understand that people are broken by wars and, and band of brothers has you know the buck compton uh, interlude where he has problems in combat it, it 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 talks about in the in the epilogue when dick winters talks about the men that some of them had problems with alcohol some of them did want to go to reunion some didn't right. and that's when kind of the modern generation understood that world war ii right is not just about the casualties who are buried under the crosses but it's the casualties who who, who came back and were, were were broken by that war and we discussed in our chat before this show you know i as a tour guide here i always tell people it's not just those buried in the cemeteries not those it's those that took back the injuries the mental scars and it's the, the knock-on effect you were a casualty of d-day your sister was a casualty of D -Day, your mother your father's second and third wife they were all in a sense casualties of world war ii because your father uh were affected them with his behavior so world war ii had this huge effect on all of you um so wh where where are you now i mean your father passed away um in 2005 so right. how had things been between the two of you in those last few years well mostly good except for uh basically he was starting to have problems with his third wife and i i got caught in the middle of some of them uh, so um there were, as I said before, there were some bumps there, but, but basically, you know, as he was, as he was dying, uh, I was, I was working full time and, um, he was, he was at a rehab center cause he had had pneumonia, you know, it basically his, his, uh, COPD was getting worse. He was at a, a rehab center in San Bernardino and his wife, uh, had gone on some a flight attendance reunion so he was pretty much like by himself and he was about the rehab center she put him in was about 80 miles from where they lived 
and I was calling him every day and I was getting more and more scared. Uh, I know the one day I, I called, uh, the nurse said, oh, he had gotten out of bed and fallen. That's because they never answered like, you know, sort of the call, the call bell. Mm -hmm. So I, one of my, my close friend, Eileen, who worked with me, I'm like, would you go out, <laughs> would you go out to California with me? Because oh, I have to get my dad out of there. And uh, she agreed. And we went, we got him out of there. We got him into a hospital. Uh, he, uh, I had to go back and, you know, get back to work. And I remember, like, I knew when I was leaving, it was the last time I was going to see him. And he just, like, sort of hugged me and he kept saying, my baby girl, my baby girl, my baby girl. And then he said, get out of here. Because he didn't want me to see him cry, I'm sure. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, he... We had talked to him. Uh, my friend Eileen had created the Daughters of D-Day webpage. He just started at that point. And we showed him and he was really sort of happy about that. And do you mind if I just get a drink of water real fast? Yeah, no problem at all. I'll, I'll, I'll say a couple of words while we're Thank talking. You. So, I mean, <laughs> for folks watching, the reason I wanted to have Carol on the show is because I've got a library, as you can see behind me, of about 1,200 books about World War II. And they're about the battles, they're about the aircraft, they're about the tanks, they're about the commanders. But there's one book I, I have, I actually lend it to someone I haven't got, otherwise I'd hold it up, and it's Carol's book about her father. Because it's the one that, that tries to make a sense of what people went through and the journeys. And I'm sure there's people watching this who didn't understand quite what their uncle or their grandfather or their father or their mother or their brother went through. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a very emotional read, reading your book. And Chris Shaw is watching today and Chris Shaw has got his airborne page on Facebook. And it's one of the books that had an impact on his life and other people I've spoken to had an evening impact on their life. And I think that's the positive message. I think we should sort of end with shortly is that that, that everything did end up up better in the end there was there was this full circle there that your father went through some very bad times that had an effect on you and your family and and, and bad times for all of you and yet there was this this kind of resolution um and the other thing i wanted to discuss because we will bring it to end sort is this there's a there's a problem with this mystique about the airborne. I mean this. I'm I'm going to be very careful with my words now. We all you know there's the, Facebook and Twitter is flooded with tribute pages to airborne and the Brotherhood and the All Americans and the 101st and the Screaming Eagles and and we celebrate and honour what they did as as they deserve as all the men and women of World War Two do. But there's not enough I don't think out there about the toll it had on some of these people because it was a shut up and grin and bear it generation. Yeah. Um, and and their families became a shut up and grin and bear it. And as we began before you went live, uh, you know we're talking about our respective childhoods. Whatever childhood you're going through, you assume it's normal because it's your childhood. It's only when you start comparing it to other people's you realize, hang on, my childhood wasn't that normal at all. But in fact, across the USA, across Britain, across Canada and Australia, there were lots of families going through these problems through the 50s and 60s and 70s of alcohol and 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 so you know it, it adds to surprisingly you. common you still there yeah 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 so are you there i'm still here so to, to round things off because we have been talking about it so what what have you i mean it's a, it's a, a crappy question but what have you learned what what's what's the what what lesson from life have you learned by going through this process uh, lesson from life. Okay, well, I learned, I learned a whole lot about myself. I learned about my, my, it was a real journey trying to uh, write this book and going through, it was an emotional journey, but it was very therapeutic. I learned that I wasn't alone. I got a lot of responses from other children who said, I thought I was the only one. And I think, you know, like you said, you think you're the only one. And I, I died was it the only one there were like a lot of us were going yeah. through this uh yeah. and i learned to be stoic but i learned to be compassionate too um uh, so i guess they were they were the life lessons like trying to combine those two because my dad at his core was a very um jovial empathetic person uh at his core and I, I think maybe that's why he was so affected 
because others weren't, you know, a lot of others weren't, but uh, I don't know. I don't know why he was, he was so impacted, but he was, and, you know, and I, I learned like sort of a lot about my family dynamics about coming. I, I really never came to peace with my sister's death. I mean, you never really totally get over those things, but I sort of understand why she made the, cho the, the choices that she did, uh, the, some of the reckless choices that she did. And I realized how much it impacted both my parents. And I realized how much in some ways my mother regretted that she couldn't stick it out, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and I realized too, that as, as tough as it was and as traumatic as some of it was, that both my parents really loved me a lot, you know? And uh, so I guess that's what I learned. Yeah, and I think that, you know, to bring it full circle, that's the thing that today, people would identify these things. There'd be support for your father. There'd be support for your mother today. You know, I've got a friend, Michelle, who came out of the American military a few years ago with, with back injuries and she was interviewed out. But there's, when you, when you discharge, there's all this process of, you know, do, you know, do you need to speak to anybody? Have you got any issues? And it, there is this structure in place now that wasn't back then. It's a testament to that generation that despite the fact they had no care, they did have this resilience. They did in the end mm -hmm. find this way of making it work. Although there were some clear, very lows in your father's life and therefore in your life, there was this sort of, I'm not going to use the word happy ending, but there was this resolution towards the end. So anyway, um, it's been really good talking to you, Carol. I know it's emotional yeah. putting you through this stuff, and I think it is an emotional interview. I, I think it's the that's the point of what we try to do with this show is that that, that we celebrate what these people did, but also understand the toll it took on them, and that that when they came back, it was a very different world, and that and they but they 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 close things off, and it caused problems, and 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 thank God we're in the world we are now, where there is, as I say, this this infrastructure in place to deal with it. That's the. That's again the world. The World War Two generation were the were the kind of the guinea pigs in a sense for this. And by the time we get to the Iraq and Afghanistan generations, there's infrastructure in place. So anyway, thank you very much, Carol, for joining me. It's been really good. I'll just mention what we've got coming up, folks. So uh, I've got a day off tomorrow. Then uh, the the following day is the start of four night. Uh, no, so it's the Mitch Yockelson talking about um, the generals on D Day, and then we have Alex Kershaw about the Liberator. We have Marty Morgan about Grainier, and we have David O'Keefe about Dieppe. So we've got a bit of four shows coming up late this week. It's getting really thick and fast, the shows through January and February. I've got them coming all the time now. Please check out my new Conflict on Camera series on YouTube, little short shows about World War II photos. Don't forget to check our Twitter feed, Facebook feed, click the, uh, the subscribe button, check out our Patreon page. And again, the link uh, to how to get Carol's book about her father, you know, it's, it's definitely worth reading. It's definitely worth uh, passing on to that member of that person, you know, who's understanding what their father went through or trying to understand it. Carol's book will help you make that journey yourself. So thank you very much, Carol. Um, thank you so much, Paul. No, I it's, uh, it's, I've, I've, I wouldn't have enjoyed it. It's been important. So I'll see you all again on World War II TV very shortly. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I'll see you all again. Thank this you. is Paul Woodadge saying good night. All right. Bye.